Cinematologist presents the London Film Festival 2023. In this episode, Neil and Dario discuss some of their highlights from this year's London Film Festival programme. They both go in depth on two films each, with Neil looking at Shuzhen Wei's Only the River Flows and Pat Collins' That They May Face the Rising Sun, and Dario going deep on Tran An Hung's The Taste of Things and Coriada's Monster. Elsewhere, there are discussions on some other films that the pair have seen, as well as conversation about the differences between watching online versus being in the cinema space, and how some people can just be really annoying by going to screenings in bad faith to be contrary to the consensus and to make people's post-screening experience a little bit uncomfortable. Hopefully you won't feel uncomfortable during this episode. Welcome back to the podcast. On with the show. Welcome to the Cinematologist Podcast. I'm Dario Linares, and with me, of course, it's a sight for sore eyes at the end of the week. It's Neil Fox. How are you doing, bud? I'm good. Uh, pleased to be easing your eyes uh, at the end of this, <laughs> at the end of this week. Um, yeah, you it's been a, that, were you? I was not, but it's a nice. It was a nice <laughs> surprise. Um, pleasantly received. Yeah, I'm okay. My eyes are sore. Um, lot of screen time. Lot of lot of meetings online. Lot of right. stuff, but busy week but yeah pretty good uh looking forward to yeah looking forward to getting this episode up um had a nice week a couple of weeks watching films um a couple of you know put a couple of bonus episodes out now from lff for 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 people um so yeah feeling feeling okay and i really enjoyed the the lff sort of opportunity to just have a kind of excuse away from sort of the, the day-to-day yeah. to just be like oh, i'm going to watch something yeah it's been I've, I've really enjoyed that um so yeah looking forward to looking forward to, to talking with you today and um yeah pretty feeling pretty good i have to say cool cool yeah i mean i wish I'd, I'd i honestly wish i'd have been able to see more i've just had a really rough couple of weeks in terms of amount of work to to get through and i've sort of been moonlighting being able to go and see various things at the cinema and it's gotten. I've gotten home various evenings and watched stuff on the on on the player, um, but I wish I'd have been able to see see more than I have. I think. Although I think it's been an interesting mix of films from what I've seen. I mean, I don't know. Obviously, you you could talk very much to the player itself. What did you think of the quality of the stuff that you'd seen on the player this time around? I thought overall it was really strong. Um, I, I was surprised. I think it was better than the last time I did it, which was. 2021 um yeah and i sort of mentioned this on the first bonus but i was i i liked that it was a kind of spread across the programs but there wasn't really much that was in the the top tier you know or the kind of the gala stuff yeah no there wasn't you know but i I, that was okay because i think a you know it's nice to for us to be a you know because you could you could see you did see some stuff from that those kind that kind of echelon in the cinema um which we'll mention today, um, and also just it was a, it was a good excuse to to kind of read a bit more about stuff, and you know to kind of to just delve a bit deeper than than I might have done. I think I might have been kind of swayed by the stuff I've been hearing about other festivals like the Hamaguchi or you know stuff or the the link later where it's like oh I really want to see that, and if it was there I probably wouldn't have delved into the other stuff. And it was really yeah really enjoyable. Some some really really good stuff i think I, I enjoyed pretty much everything i saw there was something to recommend and everything there was only one film that I, which i'll mention as i mentioned today which is a bit like nah. um but otherwise yeah really good and i have to say chris lawrence the publicist um who we worked with a number of times did send me a couple of links as well um uh which was really cool. nice and to one that i'm going to talk about today which was maybe my favorite thing i saw so yeah really really good online experience i have to say 
Yeah, well, I was looking for that one, um, but then couldn't find it because um, it, it wasn't on the player. So you must have gotten a link for that, which is great, which is uh, good. But yeah, it was, it, it was good because I um, I sort of was in two minds about what I wanted to see half the time. Um, but then when there was bigger films on in the morning, or bigger in terms of you know name recognition for the directors, particularly. I, I I went to those when I could. I missed out on um, the Scorsese um, Killers of the Flower Moon, which is out in a in a week or anything or, or something. Anyway, it's just it, it wasn't like a festival film for me. It was like, well, this is out basically now. Um, and I did see I did see a couple of things I thought were duds, um, and, and then other, other other films. There's one film which I'll just sort of mention in a second, which, which really sat. It kind of grew on me as the film went on. I was like, "What is this?" You know, when you're watching a film, you're like, "What? What is this? Is this isn't funny, or this is this is supposed to be funny, or is it supposed to be weird?" Or, you know, it was like it, it was ultimately quirky. But then I think it kind of won me round in the end, which was which was quite which was quite good. And you know, I watched some of the stuff that you've talked about on the on your bonuses. So, um, Celluloid Underground and Terrestrial Verses. I, I watched both of those, which were. Interesting in their own ways, I thought. You know, neither yeah. of them I, I thought was stone cold classics or anything like that. But I think definitely, you know, everybody out there should, should check check Neil's bonus out on those two films because they're interesting movies from um, Iran. I haven't managed to watch any of the ones from your British features one yet, but maybe if, I don't know how long the the player goes for. Um, but yeah, the I mean, we can maybe we can go into our sort of honourable mentions before what we're going to do. Um, just so you know, you know, to 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 flag it is we're going to talk about two films each in in detail, but maybe a, a few honourable mentions just to just to kick off with. So Neil, what do, what do you want to talk about in terms of things that you kind of liked but didn't make it into your final cut, a very <laughs> precise final cut? Yeah. So, well, one's not really an honourable mention. One's a mention because if I mention yeah. it, then I'll have acro- across this and the bonus, I'll have mentioned all the features that I saw. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll right. just I'll just mention it, which was Catching Fire, the Anita Pallenberg story, the documentary about Anita Pallenberg. Which, yeah, it's I found it really kind of not annoying, but like it kept make, making me question like. You know, it, it does that thing which I think a lot of documentaries do nowadays, which is like the 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 importance of a person is assumed. So therefore, this kind of presentation right. is just like, well, we we all know this person is important, you know. And the film never really convinced me of her importance, other than the fact that you know she had a really hot, tragic life, really difficult life. Um, she was obviously massively exploited, um, particularly in the nineteen seventies you know um but her kind of it kind of made this argument for her kind of importance in rock and roll history because of her association with the rolling stones and i just never felt the film convinced of that you know it was interesting to hear her diaries read by scarlett johansson um but yeah i just i was like you you it's i just it didn't do enough work to kind of to find what was really unique about her as a person and sort of convey that i felt and yeah, it, it just it felt very formulaic in terms of the way it was put together. It was nicely, you know, nicely put together. Um, and the stuff about her acting career was particularly interesting. Around, and her relationship with the, the filmmaker Volker Schlondorf was really, it was really, that was, but again, it wasn't a huge part of it. It never really knew where to, where to sort of say this is, this is why she matters kind of thing. Um, other than the fact that, you know. Uh, all lives matter uh, to use that phrase um so it was it was yeah i just i was never really convinced by it as a as a as to as to what they were trying to convey um the the other film which i really liked was last summer which was the uh catherine brea uh, film i watched it last um, night theo va venir vivre chez nous ça fait un bout de temps que pierre rêve de se rapprocher de son fils c'est l'occasion Chercher des clubs, tu m'accompagnes. Des fois, tu ne dis pas que je suis un vieux con. Jamais. Théo, lui, me considère comme un vieux con. Hier, il m'a dit que j'avais adopté les filles uniquement pour me donner bonne conscience. Tu 
veux une bière Mais il va falloir d'abord passer par le magnétophone. Il va falloir me raconter ta première fois. Est-ce que toi, j'ai te parler J'ai eu des vrais échanges avec Théo. Il m'a dit que vous deux, vous... que tu as eu une liaison avec mon fils. Tu vas pas me dire que tu l'as cru une seconde. Je sais plus qui croire. Ne me touche pas. Ton fils est un monstre. Et toi bien ça dans la tête. Il veut que tu me rejettes pour t'avoir pour lui tout seul. Yeah, I I thought it was great. I I'd see I've seen the original, the Danish Queen of Hearts, um, which was on Mubi for ages. I don't know if it's still up there, but I'd seen that, and I was really interested to see what 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 Bray Art would do with it because I'm not a huge fan of Bray Art's work. I haven't I've seen some, and it's you know I've always kind of I can sort of admire what she's done, but it's never really been that taken with it. But so I wanted to watch this to see how she would interpret this story. And it's very different in terms of the. It's pretty much beat for beat for the first hour, and right. then it kind of shifts into its own thing. And she takes a very different approach to the relationship that unfolds in the story, which is between a kind of uh, a lawyer who kind of specialises in looking after young women, sort of you know defending young women, and um, and uh, and and the, her seventeen-year-old stepson um, is kind of wayward. Yeah stepson who sort of comes to live with with her and her husband and after that relationship starts Bray Art's film takes a very different approach to it which was which kind of fascinating in comparison to the to the the first first film but what was yeah, amazing it's quite about formulaic it was, for the first 45 minutes is it? sorry sorry Neil I was just gonna no, say no. it is quite formulaic in the in the first 45 minutes and it it really sort of leans on the stereotype of a kind of adolescent French wayfish boy and almost to the sense of really this 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 kid is just so you know cliche ridden mm. how, how is this film going to be able to sort of go beyond what is what what it obviously is at, at this point but yeah without I, I don't want to sort of talk too much about that because it does go off in in kind of interesting you know in an interesting direction i think yeah it really sort of plays out the the kind of yeah the very broad morality kind of archetypes of the story in terms of her being this really kind of upstanding crusading moralistic lawyer you know kind of idyllic family wayfish kind of yeah um kind of yeah outlaw stepson and then yeah just it just it just unfolds really interestingly and i don't know if you've seen this but i recently watched incredible but true the quentin de pierre film which is a really, oh, no. really strange. I mean, he makes really strange movies anyway. He, he made like Deer Skin and Rubber, and he's he, there's this film. It's on Mubi, and it was out last year. And it's about this couple who buy a house, and in the house there's a portal, like a tunnel, which takes you forward in time eighteen hours if you go through it. But at the same, when okay. you emerge after eighteen hours, it I, I'm, I'm I'm going somewhere with this. Um, it you're actually three days younger, so. Ah. Leia, Leia Drucker, who plays the the woman in Last Summer, who the lawyer, she's the woman in Incredible but True, who becomes obsessed right. with this idea of going through this tunnel and de aging herself. And I think Leia Drucker is a brilliant actress. So I was watching this film, thinking, yeah, oh, this yeah. is you could almost read this as a real kind of investigation of aging, you know, particularly women, female aging, and how kind of complicated it is societally in terms of this woman getting older yeah. so i thought she was brilliant in it and i really went with her into these really kind of dark and uncompromising places and the moment there's a moment in the film where it all shifts which is when the husband finds out and sort of confronts her with it and it hap it's the same as in, in queen of hearts this is a moment which i just think is such, I mean, it's such a good story point and the whole film hangs on it and she just sells it so well yeah. and it's just so dark yeah, yeah. it's so dark yeah. um and it was brilliant so yeah i was i was really pleased to see that that pop up um and i really enjoyed that yeah yeah definitely worth a look for sure what about you yeah well it's th there's quite a lot i could s say i was just trying it was difficult to to narrow down my honorable mentions um 
The one film that, that I, I just alluded to earlier on was called Sky Peels. This is kind of like a... What's how, how to describe? Indescri- it's generically kind of indescribable. It's it, it it it's a story of this young guy called Adam, who's a British Asian for what for all intents and purposes. But it really plays with that idea of of identity in terms of setting up a character who essentially is completely alienated from everything and everybody. And and right at the beginning, I was kind of like. You know, this this is going to be a story about somebody with some kind of quote unquote condition on the spectrum, but the 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 main character works at this in in a a you know that awful liminal space which is the motorway service station, which is where Sky Peels gets its name from. So he's working in this in this burger joint, and it's almost as if like the people around him, he's completely alienated from them, and they're alienated from from him and all of the situations are set up so that they, they don't quite work together and you don't quite know why he's doing the things he's doing and why the people are around him treat him the, the, the way that they do nothing kind of works in a in in a in what you would understand as a as a conventional social situation you know whether it's a, whether it's a dramatic film or just you know how people interact with each other and he he finds out. He, I mean, early on, he finds out his father has passed away, and he, he sort of gets into discovering that his fa- father had these sort of feelings as well. And what his father put it down to was he thought he was an alien, like a real alien, right? So suddenly he's because he can't seem to understand other people and and what they're asking of of him and and the, and the sort of situations around this this station, which is very much a kind of you know, you can imagine what what a you know what a um, a service station or a, or an airport or any of these kind of yeah. institutionalized commercial yeah. environments look like at the death of night when there's nobody there. It's like a setting that's just from hell, really. Do you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, he's kind of he, he's trying to, trying to figure out then whether whether you know he's got this same affliction and, and he comes to sort of see himself as I I think I'm an alien as well. This must be the explanation why I don't kind of seem to fit in ev- everywhere and and <laughs> you know he has this really hard time with at the funeral because he has to go and visit with his uh muslim family and again he's alienated from them as uh, as well and he's very he's very english and they're very much you know going through the 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 funeral and at the mosque and all this kind of stuff so there's all of the uh traditions and the rituals that go go along with that so it's kind of like it's kind of like alluding to this idea that um how what does it mean to feel alienated but literally going to the point of literally thinking i i must be an alien because i'm so alien, alienated so it's really kind of quirky and weird and a very sort of um simmering sort of story you don't really know what's going on because i didn't know anything about it before i'd gone in i was like for the first 45 minutes i was like what is this this is just somebody throwing ideas at a wall and and seeing seeing what happens but more and more i kind of was like oh yeah i can see what's what's going on there i can I, i'm getting the joke now and it and it sort of drew me into the point where i thought oh actually that's not a bad piece of work for somebody who's taken like a <laughs> a small crew a small cast one location and tried to make something a little bit different out of it so yeah so that's called um sky peels so so okay. you'll, you'll be released it'll be really streaming i think great so yeah just uh, the, the other couple of things like uh, the other thing i just wanted to mention was the just the reminder of how great i mean i know we've been talking a little bit about the uh the online platform but it's just a reminder of the kind of interesting experience of going to the cinema at festivals and particularly in the press screening um so I went to see this this um, science fiction called Foe, which is directed by a guy called Garth Davis. He did that film with um, he did that film about Mary Magdalene. Yeah, you know, with uh, oh god, what's her name? Um, Rooney Mara. All oh, right, and Joaquin it, Phoenix. And I think that got that. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, and Chitwell Adjia for as well, and which I think I watched half of, but I didn't think it was very good. And then before that, did Lion with. Um, uh, oh God! What's his Dev name? Patel. Dev Patel. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So again, this is like he's obviously, and he's only. This is his third film, so he's used to working with big name directors. So in this is Saoirse Ronan and Paul Mescal, and so I, I rocked up to the uh, to the cinema, and who's who's at the front of the LFQ? Mark Kermode. Right, so I, I just walk up and I said, hello, Mark, are you going into the see this film? He says, and it, it, it was funny because he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, normally I'd, I'd be going to the press screening, but I couldn't get in, but they invited me down here. So he, so I'm just desperate to get in and see this film because he's got to do a right for it. And he says, just stand there and come in with me, it's fine. So I ended up sitting next to Mark for the film and watching it. And it's it's one of those films that have got, that's full of ideas, but coherently, I don't think it, it works. It really didn't know what it what it wanted to do. And that's evidenced by the fact that I sort of well, Mark turned to me straight afterwards and said that was all right until it, until it had about five endings at the end, yeah. and I, literally that's exactly what I was thinking in my head. This this film doesn't know whether it's an eco drama. It doesn't know whether it's something about the morality of treating AI, you know, non human sentient beings. It doesn't know whether it wants to be something about how we don't know we can, we can never really truly know the other person in a in a relationship. It doesn't know whether it's something about you know, the way that government acts on, on people. You know what I mean? All of these things that are, that are fairly standard sci-fi tropes are in there. And it's quite a handsome yeah. movie, you know what I mean? It looks good, but it never really sort of lands, I, I, I didn't think. But again, interesting uh, watching it with Mark and getting that immediate feedback. And then an, um, another film that I went to see, which I think has been one of the ones that has landed, you know, in a, in a real way with, with audiences was... Um, All of Us Strangers, which is the Andrew Haig movie. And so this is uh, Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal again. So he's a flavor of the month at this festival. <laughs> um, but yeah, th- this was a film where as I was watching it, I was like, am I reading this wrong or is this a masterpiece? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And I don't want to, I, I haven't put it on the list to talk about because I think me and you probably might end up talking about this at some point anyway. It's going to be a big movie. I think it's going to do a lot of press when it comes yeah. out. So it might be something we'll, we'll, I'd like to talk to you about it with, with the frame of reference of you having seen it. But you know, when you're watching something you, and you're not quite sure, you're like, I think this is brilliant. And I'm looking around at people and like, you know what? It, it's like difficult to, it's difficult to sell, tell. But at the end I could see there were some people who were literally in tears at the end, but then on the way out, a couple of people behind me, there was a typical, you know, again, to say this, without sort of stereotyping. it's like, There was a t- typical middle-aged white dude, just like me and you, <laughs> who was pontificating about how this was wrong with it, how that was wrong with it, how that was wrong with it. And I was like second-guessing myself and I was like, and it was really annoying as well. Like, let, let's put it that way. But I was like, is he right? Am I missing something here? Anyway, I went online afterwards and sort of, you know, had a look at what a few people who I knew were at the festival were saying about it, who I'd seen in the room. And it, I, I wasn't second guessing myself. They were like that. That's one of the best films that they'd seen at the festival, if not, you know, a film of the year, kind of thing. So it was just, and, yeah, and yeah, quite a few yeah. people commented have, have commented through the festival about comments in the press screenings mm. of people walking out and just loud, shitty hot takes when other people are are trying to formulate their their sense of a movie. And yeah, I, I just think it's an interesting sort of. Um, social faux pas to me that you loudly pontificate on the way out of a press screening with a whole load of critics there what what you think you what you think the film is or isn't or and it wasn't even as if it was his subjective opinion it was like oh this is bad because this 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 and this and i just you know i really wanted to take turn around and say excuse me you did but but you know decorum prevented me yeah i didn't because you know i just didn't you know i don't want to start those kinds of antagonisms on a 10 o'clock on a tuesday morning whenever it was um but yeah all of us strangers is fantastic great um, yeah, I, th- I don't think it's a faux pas, is it? Because it's intentional. You know, what's interesting is that, you know, and this is always the case at f- a festival like London, where most of the films have screened elsewhere. I mean, if you've been paying attention, like to the the festival coverage, I mean, I pay quite a lot of attention to festival coverage. So that film screened, I think, at Telluride first, then Venice. And w- it just was one of the best reviewed films out of Venice. Like it's been, you know, hugely well received Lauded. across the board already yep. um you know andrew scott heavily tipped for an oscar nomination if not a win you know like this is going to be one of the year's big big movies on in terms of critics end of year so you just know that there are people who are following that who are like i'm going to find stuff wrong with it you know it is the bad faith thing of like and what is annoying is that yeah 
that person has gone to that screening, probably taken a seat that someone else who would have been more open-minded or actually really wanted to see the film couldn't get. And it's just purely for the point of ruining it at the end. And I don't say that as, you know, as kind of a naive thing. I've seen it happen loads and it's so, it's so annoying because you're like, what is the point of that? You know, like if you want to have a discussion about it, great, but you're clearly just trying to take the air out of the room for your own personal satisfaction. And it's just, it's yeah that's kind of oh that, that that riles me up as well it's interesting what you were saying there though about kind of second guessing because one of the things that's been interesting about the films i've seen is that getting bombarded with a lot of pr you know a lot of emails about i oh, watch this film and here's the reviews and stuff and i've tried to watch f- try to watch stuff without that yeah. kind of thing but you do end up watching it going well you know is this good do i like it you know it's much it's a much more secluded environment and I do miss the the cinema experience for that. For that kind of yeah, what's the what's the temperature in the room? You know, can I talk to someone about it straight away to get a sense of it? Um, you know, so that's been really enjoyable. But there is that there is that thing of like yeah, well, would I feel differently if I saw this in, with a room of people and was able to talk about it? And I think that's interesting about the films as well. Um, so I'm glad that. But uh, as is always the case, those people end up looking kind of silly because you know consensus forms around great films for good reasons a lot of the time you know some films are just great like you know they just are yeah 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 and the other and the other thing is as well it wasn't particularly insightful if he had said something that was like oh yeah do you know what i didn't actually think mm-hmm. about that yeah, yeah. but it was almost kind of like this film is is this film is basically a psychological movie where you don't know what the main character is actually experiencing or just thinking, mm. right? It, it starts off, it's one of those movies where it starts off, you think it's in the real world and then you realize a lot of it's in its head. And then by the end, you don't know what's in his head and what's not, yeah, yeah. right? That's the whole point of the movie. And he was pontificating about, oh, well, I didn't buy the this character would have been in that building or and had this kind of job. And it's like, that is so far away from what the film is actually yeah. about. You know, yeah. it, it it was like a you know a completely point. It's like when when people when something is shot in an area, and somebody who lives there goes, "Well, it doesn't look like that." And I understand that criticism, but if you don't live there, you don't give a shit. No, no. <laughs> and, and it's a movie. It's a movie, people. Yeah, it's a movie for fuck's sake. You know? yeah, yeah. Sorry, we're well, going to put explicit on this. I'm getting yeah. very swearing. <laughs> you know? Fair do. It's it's justified swearing though. Um, indeed, indeed. Cool. Okay. Hello. Hi. Saw you looking at me from the street. I'm assuming you're not with anyone. Never see you with anyone. To see mom and dad. Yeah. They died just before I was 12. I'm trying to write about them at the moment. How's it going? Strangely. Hi. Hi. Is this real? Does it feel real? Our boy's back home. Our son. Look at you. You were just a boy. Now you're not. It was a long time ago. Yeah, I don't think that matters. Maybe I didn't treat you quite as good as I should. I've always felt like a stranger in my own family. Maybe I didn't love you. I'm always scared of something. Quite as often as I can. Always running away. Do you remember? I never came in your room when you were crying. It's funny, it doesn't take much to make you feel the way you felt back there again. Do you think you'd like to be in love with them? I'd always fall in love. This is a new feeling. You and me together into the world. It's 
So, um, yeah, do you want to talk about uh, one of your one of your main films uh, for today, Neil? Yes. Um, so the first of the two that I'm going to talk about is Pat Collins' uh, That They May Face the Rising Sun, which is an Irish film. It's an adaptation. It's set in the 80s in um, Galway, I think. Um, sort of, you know, kind of a rural island. And I really like Pat Collins as a filmmaker. His film Silence from, I think, sort of 2016, 2017, I'm a, I'm a big fan of. Um, and then in the run-up to this, knowing that this was screening at, at LFF, I, I finally watched Song of Granite, which is on Mubi, which I, I think is just, it's an incredible film. It's one of the best things I've seen in in ages. Like, I just, I just absolutely adored it, which is this really beautiful kind of, yeah, documentary but with kind of like dramatic elements poetic dramatic elements about the, the kind of tradi- traditional Irish singer uh, Joe Heaney who sang in Gaelic and had this really interesting life and was a really fascinating and kind of very strange person but the film is is stunning so I was really excited to see um, that they may face the rising sun because it's a it's a narrative film which is kind of much more straightforwardly narrative than other stuff that I'd seen um, and you know, we've we mentioned. You know, we've spoken briefly about because I think you've seen it, and you were like, "Oh yeah, I knew you'd like this." And it is very much, you know, a film that I would, I would kind of gravitate towards. And I, I just thought it was, I just thought it was really beautiful. I really loved its, its approach, and I, what I really loved about it was kind of unashamedly literary. You know, it wasn't like novelistic, but it kind of, yeah, you know, it, it, it took the kind of the the kind of the interest in words and and language and and kind of just yeah was was kind of unashamedly sort of presenting that and it's the story of yeah sort of a couple who are who are living in this remote um or they've sort of bought a farm and he writes uh, and she's an artist and sort of involved in a gallery and it's basically just the story of this place and the people that kind of drift in and out of their their small holding um over a period of time and there's no plot you know, um, other than other than these interactions, and slowly a, a kind of a portrait of a place emerges. Um, it's very Ozu like. Um, I think you know it's very much interested in these people, and particularly the relationship between people who are kind of set up as outsiders and the kind of the locals. Um, and it, um, the whole sort of all the tension that's in the film revolves around staying in this place and leaving this place and coming back to this place. Um, yeah, it's just I just I really, really love that. Beautiful to look at, um, and with a with just a kind of amazing cast. And I don't know, it's kind of old fashioned. Like it felt very classic, you know. Kind of reminded me that you know reminded me of sort of eighties and nineties dramas. You know where the setup was, you know, bring these characters into into each other's orbit and then play out kind of long scenes where people just sort of talk and yeah. I just, I was, I just really enjoyed that. You know, I really enjoyed the care in the the script and the care in the, the performances and the lead character, like the, the lead male character, is such a kind of passive and stoic character. He just, he just, he just lives and accepts these these people's kind of interactions with him, and very rarely does he stand out. And there's this really sort of simmering conflict with a man who uh, is is kind of an interesting figure in the village, who kind of helps him out and sort of is helping him build this sort of studio outhouse um on his on his farm and they kind of get into these conversations and there's a conversation where someone else in the village sort of returns home and this man Patrick who's a kind of prickly character really tears into this returning uh returning guy called Johnny and sort of says you know you you shouldn't have left um you know because Johnny's ended up sort of cleaning toilets in England and it's seen as this real kind of failure and he says, you know, the truth is, it's always important to tell the truth. Yeah. And and the main character just says, you know, well, what, maybe there's another way. And he says, like, well, like what? And he says, like kindness, you know. And it's just the way he says it, it's kind of devastating, you know, just right. just kindness. And it just, but in the moment, it yeah. just sets, it sets up this wall between him and Patrick, which the film really kind of keeps circling back to. And you think it's been rebuilt. And then towards the end, Johnny returns. And I won't go into it because I think it's, but but essentially, yeah, like there's, well, I think I will give it away because it's kind of, you know, it's, but there's, yeah, so I don't know. I'll say spoiler alert if you want to see it. But the reason I want to mention it is because there's a scene towards the end 
which coming from a, a kind of Irish Catholic background was so moving and so beautiful. So the main character whose game, name escapes me now, um, no everyone else's name in it. Um, he, I think it's Joe actually, I think Joe, he, um, he, so Johnny comes back from England and it, there's a sad scene with him and Joe in, the, in a pub and then Johnny dies and Patrick, who's kind of like the overseer of these kind of rituals and stuff, is, is usually the person who would lay Johnny out for the wake and for the, you know, the sort of the pre-funeral ritual with the... But he's he can't be found. So Joe is asked to prepare the body. And you see the whole... You see Joe basically prepare Johnny. And it's so beautiful. And it's so... I found it so moving. Just the care that both Joe takes, but also that the film takes to spend time with, with Johnny... Um, before he's sort of laid out for for the village to come and pay their respects, and it's it was such a beautiful scene because it's you know that Patrick should be there and him and Joe have this history and you know this is just going to be a real point of contention. But the film handled it so so wonderfully, and it's just it's a scene I've not seen before. You know that was what I loved about it was I've not seen this scene where a man has you know prepared another man and he's helped by you know he's helped in that as well but it's just it's it was such a I thought it was such a beautiful scene and I was just like this is yeah this is just it was just a wonderful moment and the film I thought was full of them and I loved how quiet it was and I loved how yeah I loved how committed it was to telling the story it wanted to tell and and in the end the sort of the the final moments between sort of Joe and and, and Patrick are really really beautiful um yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was great yeah, it's a, it, it's beautifully scripted and performed in terms of the scripts, uh, in, and it does, but it doesn't feel performed, is what I'm saying. It's like these are drawn characters, yeah. and you feel like you're not. It's like you know when you read a good novel, and you and you could you you could, you might get you might get ten pages of just conversation, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like oh, this is this is I'm feeling these characters. It, you get that from this film, this film where, mm. you know, characters may come in, especially the first half, they come in and they're kind of laughing and joking or they're upset or, you know, it's just like that little moment where the the guy comes to the door and, and he's like, oh, um, yeah, well, are you okay? And he's talking about the bus. He says, oh, I don't know where, what's going on with the bus. And he, and he, and he said, uh, oh, um, I'll, uh, I, you can't come in right now because the guy, the other guy that was, was visiting had come back. And, no, and he didn't want one of these you know, one of these old codgers from the from the village basically coming in and interrupting this conversation. But he says, I'll come down to the to the to the road with you and sort you out. And he's like, okay, that's fine. Do you know? And it was just like a little moment of oh, th- this is kind of like real life actually happening here. You know, and it, it was full of little sort of elements like that where you could feel that the the it, everything wasn't in in service of we have to move it forward. You know, to get to because we're going yeah. somewhere and we're getting to this point, which is, you know, I think a lot of times script writing is, is has that underpinning to it, and is even taught like that. I mean, Neil, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Where it's like, no, but well, let's cut this out because we need to we need to get somewhere. Whereas this just it took its time yeah. to develop the characters and let you sit with them, and the, then the, the 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 thematic and the the feelings kind of came out from within that if that makes sense which is why it has that literary flavor as you were talking about yeah no you're absolutely right yeah like the idea that everything has to move the plot forward in some way this film is is not doing that and yeah there is a real pleasure in in yeah in its literariness and also yeah and it's it's going to create its own cinematic pace and its own cinematic kind of approach um and it's yeah it's kind of it, it does that really well um and it is Joe. I've just checked my notes. It is Joe, um, the main character. Um, and so much of it just sort of takes place in the one in, around their farmhouse. You know, there's almost kind of theatrical in that sense, you know. And then it, I don't think it moves out of there for like the yeah, first 45 yeah, yeah. minutes. Um, but yeah, it's, it is, <laughs> yeah, it is a film that's not interested in those kind of ideas of, of plot um, and kind of moving it forward or even building to a big finale, a big, a big, a big kind of, dust off between mm. these characters yeah yeah great um so do you know anything about the release of that or um... no i don't know anything about that release um his films kind of right. get little bits of release you know yeah you have to search it out maybe yeah i think i think i'll definitely pay attention i think we'll I'll, I'll keep an eye on it and try and flag it up i'd actually like to talk to him i think i think i've seen enough of his work now i think he'd be a really interesting yeah. person to talk to this film had an interesting partnership with the university of galway as well which you know with my 
sound image cinema lab hat on i'm kind of interested yeah. in in so there might be there might be something in the future if i can right. if i can track him down what about you anything what's your first one you wanted to really go into yeah so i want to talk about monster ま、こういうのって母子家庭にはありがちっていうか、ま、うちも知ってくるもんだ。ほら、ほら、先生。自動の生にしたら親御さんの怒りに火がつくでしょ。一切どうだったかはどうでもいいんだよ。人の脳な
kids in sort of uh, once they get into a little bit of understanding kind of social dynamics, they can be pretty monstrous, right? And then the other thing is like the 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 parents and the school teachers, and there's a lot in this film about how um, the subtleties of sort of uh, social and cultural value are imparted on children by parents. Um, and not to, I don't want to give it away because again, there is very, very much a story of identity here and how certain identities are accepted and other ones aren't. And the fact that the children are, their behavior is responding to the, the, the requirements that their, that their parents have of them. Some of it is really overt. Like you don't, you, you're not allowed to behave like that. And other other parts of it is much more subtle in terms of not wanting to, upset your parent who is already upset about having a different you know a trauma than the, themselves yeah um and there's some really interesting stuff about death and rebirth you know a lot of sort of discussion about the idea of uh, of you know that 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 sense of a young child t- trying to come together with trying to come to terms with the loss of a parent and how the other parent who's left looking after them tries to articulate you know the the is somebody dead? Is they really dead? Do they do they live on in your memory? Can 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 a child then take on that idea of being reborn into somebody different while they're you know while they're still alive? There's loads of really interesting stuff um, going on there, but it's just in some ways I think it's a kind of film that is impressive rather than you know it's going to emotionally kill you, yeah. you know, and just be like oh my god, it's but it's just so. You know, it's like a clockwork, you know, like a Swiss watch in terms of the editing and the scripting. It's so amazingly well done. And it's quite dark in, in places, but it does have a, um, a a redemptive element to it, I think. And and it, I mean, just the, the last thing to, th- it, to say, I think, is it, it really does show you that, that you, you can never get fully get the nuances of a a film that's coming from a different culture if you unless you're born into that culture because there's definitely elements i think of this where you would understand why certain people are behaving the way that they are because there is a, a cultural onus on them that they have to do that because society tells them tells them so um but yeah really really i mean i was just kind of like wow this this requires some thought and uh, and uh, some work to, to think what's going on here but it's really it's really worth it for sure great yeah I've, I've not seen much Coriada um, and I think that the last few have not been as well received which obviously you know is just subjective but, but it was interesting that yeah when this played at Cannes a lot of people were kind of you know labelling it that classic return to form but that, 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 that there was more going on yeah. it, and particularly in that kind of as you're alluding to there the editing and the storytelling than, than maybe sort of anything since Shoplifters so yeah, definitely wanna definitely wanna check that out when it. Yeah, and a and a and Sakamoto score as well for flavor of the month uh, filmmaker, obviously who's passed yeah, away yeah. recently, and there was a documentary about Sakamoto on the uh, LFF two, and has been doing the rounds. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, there's, I think there was another one a couple of years ago. So it's he's yeah. There's there's a lot of Sakamoto stuff. I think this was this was his last score as well. So yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. So what's next for you? Well, staying in that region um, of East Asia, but going to China uh, for uh, Only the River Flows. Um, so this is a filmmaker called Shijun Wei, who I heard about at Cannes this year about this film. So on a couple of podcasts, I think it was on the last thing I saw, uh, they were talking about it. And they were talking about this filmmaker whose films have shown at various big festivals in the last few years. And they all of his films sounded fantastic. Right. There's one about a kind of film student, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds great," you know. Um, but never, never, never got. They've never got a release here, so they've, I put them on my watch list. I was kind of thinking, okay, well, let's um, uh, let's see what um, let's see when they arrive and stuff. And then this film I saw was was here, and there was sort of got a press release from Chris Lawrence, um, who I mentioned before, and I said like. Obviously, I'm not going to be there in person. Is there a screener? I really want to see this. And Chris was kind enough to to get one. This is probably the film I wanted to see the most um, in terms of a new filmmaker that I, I hadn't seen any work of but was kind of excited to see. Um, so I was kind of really, really looking forward to this. And I I just I thought this film was fantastic. Um, it tells the story. It's a very straightforward story. 
in the sense of it's a detective trying to solve a series of murders on the in, in on this riverbank uh in this um in this kind of small city and it follows a lot of the kind of very regular procedural beats you know quite similar to a decision to leave you know he kind of he becomes kind of obsessed by it um this sort of interesting sort of family uh, relationship at home with his wife um and he just kind of gets drawn into to solving this and he's got a kind of police like a police superior and like the state want these kind of murders sold very very quickly and they so they're trying to convict all of the easy easy options and he this main detective is convinced that it's none of these things um that it's something else there's something else going on and he just refuses to believe it's all of these easy stuff and so it kind of just really kind of unravels um and he unravels alongside it and then so it's it starts off feeling like um yeah kind of almost like a, a Kateshi Kitano film like very kind of it looks beautiful it's shot on right. it's shot on um on film as well which is which is fab um it's really kind of starts quite offbeat but then it takes a lot of these turns and it becomes much much closer to Bong Joon-ho's Memories of Murder or even Fincher's Zodiac um yeah. where he just becomes completely obsessed um with trying to find out what's happened in terms of how he believes it and that but there's so many layers to it there's 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 a so he's trying to conceive a child with his wife and he's told sort of early on that there's a chance that the child will have severe uh kind of impairments um could be heavily disabled do they want to kind of continue with the the pregnancy and he's like maybe we shouldn't and the wife is like you don't get a say kind of thing so there's but what's interesting is that's paralleled in the story where everyone wants to pin the the murders on this um someone that they called um they just call him the madman you know and it's this kind of you know uh local character with kind of severe learning difficulties um who's kind of seen as this kind of mad character and he sort of sees this character's life and you can tell he's just thinking that he just does not want this life for his own child and so he's trying to protect this mm. character but you don't know whether this character's done it or not like it's really cleverly done in terms of you, it, you you're never sure whether the evidence is pointing to one of these characters or not and um whether you're kind of he's just kind of wanting it to be something else for all these other reasons um including something from his past as well like this this there's a lot of stuff that's kind of going into it um one of the cleverest things about it is that at the start of the film um and this is just a brilliant device sort of visually is at the start of the film they're looking for a place to hold the investigation to kind of to put this kind of detective department that he leads and his superiors like there's this old cinema they're shutting down the cinema because no one goes to the cinema anymore so we can put you in the cinema so yeah they're kind of they 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 build the they build the like the detective office on the stage of this old kind of breaking down cinema so it's almost like and then and so much of the film is you is it puts the audience in the audience of the cinema looking at them on the stage which would be the screen kind of acting out this kind of detective they're just working but it feels like you're watching them act out solving this this mystery and then slowly it starts he as, as his kind of mind unravels he starts to kind of get the idea in his head that there's there's something like you start to feel the film in his head like so you start to see it as a movie and then there's this really kind of interesting tension between what is real and what is a film that he's kind of imagining to the point where the film stock starts to deform and films you know like the he's watching this film which is which then becomes um like the reality of the film and it all kind of breaks down um and at that point you realize that he has just completely kind of completely lost the plot um and it's great because there's you know there's just everything takes place in this cinema so there's like his office where he's kind of interviewing people he's surrounded by old 35 mil cans and old posters and stuff and it's just like it's so it's it's so clever but you think it's just kind of nice aesthetic touch until you realize that the the narrative of the the investigation he's kind of he's kind of latching onto the narrative in a way that is really unhealthy for him and not really necessarily paying attention to what the evidence is and there's a point where the evidence kind of becomes 
you know, un, uh, sort of un, you can't ignore the evidence, but he kind of does, um, and that's where you realise he's going down this down this rabbit hole. There's some great stuff with a cassette, which reminded me of Lynch. Um, yeah, it's just it's just I just thought it was amazing, um, and I just can't wait to see more of his stuff. Uh, yeah, it just it was just really stand out. It's one of those films where you're like, this is a filmmaker who's clearly in touch with a lot of influences, the ones I've mentioned, but. It never feels derivative of that stuff. It really feels like it's in dialogue, and just as a as a kind of detective story, um, it's just really, really satisfying. Great! Wow, that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. I might I, I might tap Chris up and see if I can get it myself. Uh, just to have a watch. You should. Yeah, it's, it was it was fab. I don't know whether it'll let me though after the fact of actually reviewing, having you know you having reviewed it. Um, but we can we can but ask we can but ask but I think I think they're they're planning a release for it you know and I think oh are they right I, th- I was going to say yeah, yeah. If, you know yeah and I think the more th- again it's one of those things that the more people are talking about these new filmmakers um, the better you know and I think it's a film that's coming out of China with with a lot of genre kind of well you, you know so it's a serious genre movie but it's also really interesting it's set in the nineties I should say as well so it's kind of critique of nineties China and contemporary china is really interestingly woven in so i think it's gonna be a film that people want more people to see and kind of and um and kind of push the word on so i'm sure he'll sure if he if he's got a link he'll share one Down to my final film then, and I'm not. I didn't go for a, a new filmmaker. I went for a well. I don't want to say an old filmmaker, but in the sense that is a is a filmmaker that I actually goes back to my university days in terms of when I became familiar with this filmmaker, who is um, the the Vietnamese French director Trang Ang Hung. Ah, nice. And this is a yeah. Th- 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 this is a filmmaker really that I think probably should be better known and should be more lauded than he actually is. Um, you know, there's there's a real sort of lineage, I think, or a real influence to the classical European canonical directors, you know, Bergman, Bresson, Tarkovsky, or Ozu. You know, you can see it's that that's that's where he is. And it's not even sort of me hyping that. You know, if you look at his back catalogue, like uh, the first film I saw of his was Ciclo back in 1995. And it was shown to me by um, the, the 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 tutor uh, Mark Shield, who's now working at King's, um, and it was one of the films that he'd written a, he'd written a, a book on, and I just thought that, that was, it's a masterpiece. It's a film that and a filmmaker I've always wanted to do an episode on Neil, so I think one day we'll do like a a full episode on on him. And then I went back and watched The Scent of Green Papaya, which kind of like you know talk about rain and green, just just great rain, you know, just top <laughs> rain in that movie. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but like, rain. I mean, he's an interesting filmmaker because he's very much at that nexus of Vietnam, the United States and France in terms of, you know, politically and socially, what Vietnam has become post the war and how those colonial powers have influenced, yeah. you know, its economic capabilities and it's so you know it's social position and all all that kind of stuff um 
But then I haven't seen the vertical ray of sun, but Norwegian wood was the last thing I saw of him, which is just unbelievably good. So the, the adaptation mm. of the Mur- uh, Murakami novel, yeah. it's so good. I can't tell you. It was like one of those one of those, one, one of those films where I watched it at home and it was like, I, I, I think I've, I've, I've enjoyed this as much as anything that I've enjoyed at the cinema. Do you know what I mean? It was like, sometimes I feel like I wish I'd have seen that at the cinema, yeah, but yeah. I was like, I just enjoyed it so much anyway, because it was so good. Um, so this film is called, in French, it's released as the pot au feu, which is a classical French dish, like very earthy, very rural, um, but released in English in America as The Taste of Things, starring Juliette Binoche and Benoit Magimel, who is in, in loads of stuff as well, and has got a very interesting face, let's put it that way, you know, very photogenic, but in that Baroque sense where it's not... You know, he's not a beautiful man, but he's a very charismatic guy, I think. Um, So it's set in the late uh, 19th century. And he plays this chef who lives in this grand house. It's intimated that he's been a famous French chef in Paris and he's gone out to live in this in this grand manner. You don't really know. He's he's clearly rich, but you don't know where the money comes from. It doesn't really get into that at all. Um, And this film is two hours and 14 minutes long and i would estimate about 70 to 80 percent of it is just watching cooking (sighs) and it's great it's absolutely (laughs) fantastic it's just wonderful and so he's the he's the main chef and and binoche is his quote-unquote cook now it's made a quite a a play of this that he's the chef and she's the cook so clearly in the past she's come to work for him but over time, they've developed a relationship and they're they're together, but they still don't sleep together in the house. You know, at the beginning, there's this moment where he sort of says to her, can I come and visit you tonight kind of thing? Yeah. And she's like, well, you'll have to come and check whether the door's locked or not. So there's this whole thing of they're still separate, then, uh, but and she locks the door unless she doesn't and leaves it open for him. So it, there's, there's all politics about whether they're getting married or not. And the, the, basically the main plot, plot line is him trying to convince her to marry him. And he cooks her this grand meal to try and c- convince her of that. Because what's interesting is she wants to keep this position as the cook that, that even though you would you would argue that she's hierarchically subordinate to him she's still got her own identity and is very much part of the you know an equal in terms of the team of these grand meals that they cook so this first meal that they're cooking they lay it out for his you know his friend of friends of um you know culinary uh you know um fans is the wrong word but absolute aficionados of of french cooking yeah, you know yeah. what i mean and one of them's a doctor one of them's a lawyer and they, you know, it's not. There's not a kind of. Um, there's no real sort of intimation about sort of class politics here. It's really just is what the story is. What it is, you know. It's not really trying to make make yeah. a political point. I don't. I, I don't think um, beyond the fact of what an audience would read onto it in terms of the gender politics and the sort of class politics of. You know, they go out and visit uh, uh, some local farms where there's farmers there and he's buying the ingredients and stuff like that. But there's some really interesting sort of dynamics in terms of um, they discover a young girl who's who be- who's the daughter of the farmers. But she's got a real she's got like a perfect palate for tasting stuff. And they decide that they want to offer to train her to come and be, you know, in the kitchen and tra- train her up as a cook. Um so and and it's kind of like you know you know it, it's nothing more than that and then there's just minutes and hours of watching these dishes being prepared <laughs> and then eaten and you know and 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 it just it just riffs around that so I mean um, again Mark uh, I was talking to Mark about this and he, he said it's kind of a little bit in that for, formal sense a little bit by, like Jean Dielman yeah without the without the overt kind of feminist politics behind it at all. You know, obviously, it's not a, a female director, and it's not kind of it doesn't have that um, that, that 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 sort of narrative driver that that's what it's getting to in the end about what her position is. There's a little bit of that, but it's just it was just so refreshing to kind of watch a film that you didn't feel like was overly saying something, even yeah. though it was set in the past and there was a there was a sort of colonial element to it, definitely. It was just a wonderful film, and to see it at the 
see it at the cinema and just watching massive close up, you know, Juliet Binoche doing the Binoche thing and, and him as the chef and they're all dressed in this certain way and all of the old style of cooking, like the old fridges and going down and, you know, he's in, at certain points, he, they're intellectualizing about what meals mean symbolically and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, some people will watch this and go, this is pretentious crap. Um, but I loved it and I left the cinema absolutely starving <laughs> and felt so gu- so guilty that basically I ran into the nearest Pret and grabbed a, 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 a very uh, low-key sandwich when I felt I needed to go and, you know, order some very expensive uh, meal and have some wine. But yeah, just just, just a, a wonderful kind of haptic experience, I think, in the, in the cinema. Sounds really pleasurable. Indeed. Indeed. And, and it's funny because the, ne- the, the next film I watched, which I didn't mention because I think we'll, we'll probably talk about this on a later episode, was Hitman, which was the funniest film I'd seen in a long, long time. It was a proper comedy. And I just laughed all the way through. So I had two films where I wasn't sort of thinking to myself, oh, you know, but what does this mean? What's the intention? What's the filmmaker trying to say? What are the politics here? And yeah, I wonder if if people thought that, I mean, obviously there's a lot of message films in festivals, but I wonder if that that kind of maybe is making a comeback where people are like, you know, we're just going to give, we're going to give the audience a good time here. And, you know, it's it, even in, in the context of a film, of a type of film like, like this, which is very a sort of U- European art house thing. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to just have some pleasurable movies uh, at the cinema. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Well, I'm hungry now just listening to you talk about it, so. Yeah, no, that's it. You better go off and go off and get some uh, broiled duck or something <laughs> like that or whatever it is. You know, yeah, well, that's one of the recipes uh, whatever you're having for dinner. Um, it won't, it won't be that unfortunately. I'm hungry yeah. myself. Yeah. No, no, that's for sure. Um Cool. So, uh, yeah, that's it for for London. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt we'd... Uh, I, I really would like to have done a kind of second episode, but I think your bonuses have been great in sort of supplementing our our London coverage. Um, so hopefully people will, got, will have got something out of that. And um, yeah, definitely these films. We wanted to focus on the things that, that what I would consider real festival films rather than just taking the films that everybody will will kind of see anyway so i hope our our listeners kind of understand that i'm sure they will being our listeners exactly if they if they're not used to that by now then you know uh there's no there's no help for them um yeah no it has been really nice to yeah to focus on some of that stuff that will hopefully make an appearance but won't make an appearance on in at the same level as some of the kind of the gala stuff so yeah and i hope people have been enjoying the the bonuses uh, they're available on um the Patreon um, page, their little collection on our Patreon, but they are open to everyone. And I'm going to, uh, when this goes out, there'll be a link to that collection because uh, the last one on short films will have will have dropped by the time this is released as well. So that the three episodes will be collected there. Um, yeah, it's been fun, been fun doing those as well. Um, and yeah, it's been a really enjoyable festival experience. So, and I think it's been nice, yeah, that it's been, you've been able to see some stuff, you know, up there that, that uh, yeah, that also is kind of in that festival vein. Great, lovely. So next up, we've got a double bill. Double bill, haven't we? We've got the Rock Hudson documentary, All That Heaven Allowed, and we've also got an interview with uh, James Dean, friend of the show, of course, about his film Apocalypse Clown that's just been released. Yeah, so James, uh, who listeners will know from sort of hosting. Uh, screenings with us over time uh, is here to talk about a film he's made which is really exciting and yeah this will be our first double header so we're going to release both of them at the same time um, which will be an interesting experiment for us um, yeah looking forward to to both of those coming out so really looking forward to putting those two episodes out um, one's in the can one's yet to be recorded but like like Neil says they'll both go out towards the end of this this month but Thank you very much for your continued support of the podcast. Those of you who um, haven't yet got over to uh, Neil's bonuses, knock yourself out, fill your boots, get on that right now. Um, But until next time, this has been the Cinematologist Podcast. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 